So my name is Travis Mills, and I am the writer, producer, and director of Blood Country, and we're here watching it together. Just want to give you a little insight into the making of the movie, and uh, yeah, all how all this came to be. These portraits that you see in the beginning were not part of the script or our original plan for the film. I believe it was a few days before we started shooting that I proposed the idea to Nick Fornwalt, the DP, and from there it evolved. Originally there were way more portraits showing more of the characters and uh, it just kind of whittled down to what you just saw uh, as things often do. The uh, concept there being just that, you know, I, I felt like to establish the tone of the film and, and to sort of show who the main players are, that it would be cool to see them as if they were posing for a painting or, or a photograph. This opening shot was filmed in Canton on a property owned by a guy named Greg Harkins, who was kind enough to let us film there and we shot there quite a few times actually um, throughout the shoot I'll try to point them out the film is based on a true story which took place in Oakvale a small place in Lawrence County Mississippi in 1884 um, I learned about this true story from a book that was given to me by my grandfather called Mississippi Gumbo, written by Robert E. Jones, or known as Bobby Jones. I never met Bobby, but I approached his daughter, Jennifer, for the rights to this, and she was kind enough to give it to me. When I first read his story, The Outlaw, The Sheriff, and The Governor, that's the title of his story in Mississippi Gumbo, I was so stunned by how well suited I felt like this tale could be for the big screen and um, it just really excited the heck out of me I, I had no intention of, of making I didn't know what film I was going to make next and when I read that story I knew that's what it was and very quickly two things happened one I wanted to call it blood country almost right after reading the story and two I wanted to cast Chris Bosarge, who plays Joe Lofton, the, the man you see in black. Um, I wanted to cast him almost from the beginning. I was thinking about him when I read the story. And I mentioned that to a couple people who I was working with at the time. And I wasn't surprised that their reaction was doubtful. Not that they thought Chris was a bad actor, but they just didn't think he was right for the role. And I stuck with it. Uh, because I think that Chris possesses naturally a very, um, he, he's a good looking guy and he's very nice and charming on one level, but on the other, there's something kind of hidden there. There's some, some, uh, devious quality that he just naturally shows. Um, this is another scene shot in Canton, Mississippi, on Greg Harkins' park, uh, property. Way out, we had to drive um, back and even at some point hike back. I think there was only one of our vehicles that could make it this far. And uh, it was a pretty intense location, like many of our locations were. This is a film that um, took a lot of energy to make driving all around Mississippi, uh, really long days because sometimes we would have to drive an hour, hour and a half to get to where we were going and an hour, hour and a half back at night. This also is part of the true story. And um, these African-American teenagers were basically the, the only witnesses for this trial for this for this murder supposed murder this actor calvin franklin came from the coast and uh, from the connection of jeremy london who joined the project about a month before we were shooting and he brought a lot of great actors to our cast something that was uh, a great last addition a, a bunch of cast members came from that group in mississippi it's amazing how talented 
there are uh, the, how how big of a great talent group there is yeah, in Mississippi, but not just there, all over the states. I think that in every community, there are some really uh, untapped um, performers, and I think that that's uh, something that a lot of people don't realize. They think that they only real professional good actors. Uh, you can only find them in New York or L.A. or New Orleans or Atlanta and that's absolutely not true. Um, they're right in front of you. And sometimes they've done very little acting at all in films before, but they can give incredible performances. I'm very happy with the cast for this. Um, it was done all through video auditions. I didn't, I didn't have any formal casting call. Um, this, all of these scenes are still shot in Canton, Mississippi and just various places on this really, really big property. One thing about this story that just struck me was that I didn't have to invent a whole lot for to come up with this script and I didn't have to fill in a lot of details like you normally would with true stories. I pretty much kept it as is. Um, and I thought that was uh, very unique that there was something that really happened and the turn of events just provided so many interesting plot points and action throughout this. The costumes, uh, you know, we were working with a very low budget um, let's just say that the whole film was made for under a hundred thousand dollars all said and done now real quick let me say this the snake was just something that we ran into on the Canton property and decided to um, just grab that shot however this shot of the boys is actually done in uh, in a place called Hazelhurst Mississippi but we picked up some quick shots of the snake, which was nice. It was a, a rabbit, I think, originally in the script. But considering the moral implications of the movie, I think a snake worked well. This was also done in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, on uh, the Mount Hope Plantation. Um, definitely one of the key scenes of the movie. Not an easy one to shoot. Uh, it was one on one of our last days we had left this to be done because we had missed it during our original schedule, so we came back to do it. And um, it was just a very difficult scene to stage and block and get the shots for. Um, what I was going to say about costumes is that, you know, this movie was made for uh, well under $100,000, and that meant that we had to be very resourceful with a lot of things. Uh, including the costumes, the wardrobe, which is not easy when you're working with a period piece. Most of them came from Cotton Yancey, who has a great collection. He plays Sheriff Dan Lee, a character who has not been introduced yet, but who's really the protagonist of the film. A lot of them also came from New Stage Theater in Jackson, Mississippi, and Bellhaven College. This is a great little cabin that's in Sontag, Mississippi. That was a fun shot to get. Um, our horse people and our horses came from Brushy Creek Ranch for the most part. And a guy named Chris and Bo were our horse wranglers. We'd asked them early on if they would be able to get a horse to run from one place to the other without a rider. And uh, it took us five or six takes. Um, a lot of the takes were usable. Uh, but that was definitely the one that nailed it. And uh, it was cool to work with horses for the first time. I really enjoyed that process, and I ended up being able to ride some, which was great. Um, I'm very proud of what Nick, our cinematographer, did with this setup, uh, specifically the wide shot there. It just feels very classic, almost like a painting by uh, Frederick Remington or someone from the realism period. Um, any of these fire scenes, we really didn't have any lit fires. We would put what's called a China ball light on the ground. And one of our crew members 
would be on standby and they would be basically making that flicker and trying to replicate the feeling of firelight. Michael LaCour, uh, the doctor, is an actor from Tennessee. Matthew Horton, right there, is an actor from uh, Greenwood, Mississippi, originally. He helped produce the movie. And a lot of these locations that you see are really ones that he researched and found, which was a great coup for us. Don Streak, the mother, uh, Streck, sorry, is from uh, Louisiana. And uh, Britton Webb, the other brother, is, is another Jackson guy. So things start to unfold in this movie as, as the uh, brothers seek justice. Um, when we were editing this, some of the people involved felt that the film was too slow. But I really think that it, it does start slow. And I think that's good because it really builds up. And though that risks, I suppose, the chance that someone might decide that they don't want to make it past 10 minutes of the movie, uh, it's the kind of movie I want to watch is one that kind of builds and builds. Now that actor playing the judge, Raymond, is a real funny guy. He had never had a big speaking role in a movie before. And so he didn't really know what it was like, and he definitely didn't know what it was like to work with me. What was great is that I think on the first day of shooting, he'd memorized all of his lines. Of course, he was nervous, and he came into a scene, and I said, we're just going to change all of the lines. Um, and it, he it said that I scared the shit out of him. Now, this breakfast scene... I think this is important to note the breakfast scene is actually in addition to the script i added this uh while we were filming as well as that scene where uh, the black teenager is approached by his uh his uncle and uh those are scenes that i just thought would flesh out the story a little bit more but they were not in the script and i'm really happy that we shot them now this cabin which we've seen once before in the film already is in a place called old silver creek and it's a great location it took some serious work by some great local people who helped me clean it up um there was a buzzard nesting inside of it throughout our entire filming experience which was a little bit nerve-wracking when it flew out one day while we were inside um but it was a great place to film, and uh, Old Silver Creek, I guess, is actually the place where one other Western was filmed back in the day, a movie called Jesse James Women. Scenes in the rain are obviously not always the easiest to do, and a lot of our horses were inexperienced on horseback. I remember this was specifically a very tough scene to get because the horses would what didn't want to cooperate well really the riders didn't know what they were doing um bringing them in so we'd get halfway through a take and a horse would spin around and the rider wouldn't be able to control it uh, but eventually we got through it and surprisingly i think it pieced together really well um this dolly shot that we pull off here was something that nick and i talked extensively about and I'm proud of the way that it came out. Uh, I'm sure that as an audience mem member that little things like that don't really stand out too much. But for us, they're like little victories. It's like making uh, you know, a, a first down on set. So um, this location is a very fascinating one. It's the Longinot House in Monticello, Mississippi. And what's great about that is that Longinot is actually a character in our film, and he's the governor that's referenced in Bobby Jones's story, The Outlaw, The Sheriff, and The Governor. Now, of course, in the movie, this location is not serving as Longinot's house, but it was very interesting to be able to include one of our characters' real homes that still exists and has been preserved by the Lawrence County Historical society um and use it in the movie was an honor 
and uh, it's just a it's a very very cool place and you also see the exterior of it in just a little bit I like keeping things in in, in shots like this where we're not just going in for the traditional coverage um, it's just boring when it's just close up close up over the shoulder over the shoulder it's interesting a lot of times just to just to do a three shot or a wide shot and just hang there or go behind a character's back how we had in a couple seams back where we don't really show the front of their faces were right behind them uh, I think it makes uh, an interesting impact on the audience when you do that um, this scene is funny because when we're filming this he'll step up in order to be the same height as Joe here the judge will step up on a box and so will Nick who plays Miles the, the guy in the back right corner um, and I remember them fighting me on set saying well that just looks so obvious that I stepped up on a box to be the same height and I told Nick um, who's looking at the frame you or me and uh, he backed down, and I think you can see that you can get away with little tricks like that on set, um, and the audience will never know. This is a great little moment between these two that's supposed to kind of set up both some tension and also a, a little bit of connection for what's going to happen later in the film between them. The following scene is one of my favorites because I like to cut dialogue as little as possible. And I really wish we'd done some more of this kind of stuff with just the characters alone and just thinking. When I did um, auditions for the film, video auditions, I actually asked each actor to record not just their lines but to do a video take where all they did is sit there and be the character in silence. And uh, I thought that would reveal a lot about how they felt for the character, but also just what kind of actor they are. If they, if they can't just sit there in silence, if they're trying to create something for something, then they might not be someone I want to work with. Um, this scene is shot in a place where I was determined to film. It's the Rodney Presbyterian Church. Rodney is an old ghost town in Mississippi. Um, very famous people here. And this church is great. Uh, my grandfather took me there years and years ago. And since then, I've wanted to film there. And we had other options for the church in Blood Country, but I insisted that we... <laughs> go all the way out to Rodney on this day of filming. And I remember when we were there, we um, we totally uh, were warned that there would be tornadoes and storms and half our extras didn't show up because of that. But there was barely any rain that day. And you just learn after a while as a filmmaker that you can't, you can't trust the weather and you can't get worried about it. You just got to take it as it comes. Um, the interior of... Joe's house here was filmed in Ripley, Mississippi, which is near the, the north end of the state. Um, so this shows you how, like, obviously as filmmakers sometimes we'll, we'll film the inside of a house somewhere. And then now, here we are in Old Silver Creek, Mississippi again at, at the cabin there. Um, and we're just connecting the two. And they were filmed on completely different days. This is an interesting scene. It was it was tough on Nick, or he was worried about filming at night. But these lanterns, um, I think it, I think it's fair to say that he was surprised at how good these lanterns gave off light. And if you'll notice, we use them a lot, put them in characters' hands and all that to give them a natural source of light. And uh, it's not easy to light and shoot a movie that looks this good, in my humble opinion, on a budget like the one that we've got. In this scene, we I paid homage to a line from The Searchers that I've always liked that John Wayne says called, Sure, we says, sure is the turning of the earth. The character of Miles says that. 
Um, these two little girls are Olivia and Caroline Quinn. Uh, they're little Jackson, Mississippi girls. And Heather, who plays Joe's wife, is currently, uh, as of now, based in Atlanta. But she had been in, in Louisiana. And um, the character doesn't have a ton. And I think she does a really good job of creating a complex woman with the very few scenes that I gave her to work with. Um, like I was saying about our horse guys, uh, they did their best to work with these actors and some actors really put the time in that they needed to, to get ready for scenes and others didn't. And I think that unfortunately, um, uh, for the actors and maybe for the movie, some of that shows some of the horse work is not as good as it could be. If I was going to make a Western again, and I plan to, I would force the actors to go through a boot camp to really learn how to ride. I wouldn't trust anyone who said that they'd had riding experience because a lot of times they were exaggerating or they were, you know, um, just flat out lying. A couple of them flat out lied about having riding experience and it shows on screen. Um, this is the kind of shot I, I love where you... You do a four shot and you have, you know, again, something that looks more like a painting than just going over the shoulder, over the shoulder. Um, and instead of getting coverage on each player, you only get coverage, the close up on cotton. And um, that really, um, it says something to the audience. If you had a close up on each of these guys, they would be. They would all have equal importance. Only having a close-up on Cotton tells the audience, this is our guy. Now, I think it's interesting that, you know, we are about 20 minutes into the movie and we're just now meeting our protagonist. And I'm curious, you know, as of now, uh, while recording this, I actually still, you know, audience has not seen Blood Country. And I'm really curious to see how people react to following a sort of anti-hero, Joe, for the first 20 minutes of the movie. And then we meet Cotton, who plays Sheriff Dan, Jan, Dan Lee, and now we're following him, and he's our true protagonist. That's something I don't see in movies a whole lot, and I'm really curious to see how an audience reacts to it. Uh, these scenes were filmed in Greenwood at a place called Forwood State Park. It's a real interesting property. You'll see some of it later. Uh, kind of a little southern western town that was built, originally used, I think, for events and all that kind of stuff. And then it kind of became a little run down. And the movie The Duel, which was originally called By Way of Helena, was shot there. And uh, with Woody Harrelson, I haven't, I still haven't seen it, but it was filmed there a couple years before ours was, and we were lucky enough that uh, the county there, Left Lord County, let us use it. This scene, we had traffic running throughout the whole scene, pretty much, and we had to ADR this line right here. Uh, that means to re-record the line in post production. Now, something that's interesting is that in the last couple movies I've done, normally you would get in an audio recording booth for ADR, but um, we do it with iPhones, which is pretty amazing that you can record clean audio with iPhone and put it in a movie and it sounds good. Um, up here, yep, there's my cameo right there as the blacksmith. Um, we had a local guy doing it and... He went through one take, and because of the heat, I think, and the fumes, uh, we almost had to call an ambulance because it just got overwhelming for him. And I put on the shirt, got all black and uh, blackened up, and, and started banging on those uh, horseshoes, which, believe it or not, was a lot harder than it looks. So that's my little cameo in the movie. Now, this guy walking away... The actor's name is Kevin McGrath. The um, character's name is Hiram. And you've seen him a couple times now. 
he is one of the biggest additions I made to the true story. He was not in the true story. When I wrote the script and showed it to my partner in crime, Gus Edwards, he said that he felt that the the people who are against Joe Lofton and want him killed need a bigger identity because Joe ends up having this uh, Joe gang and that the, the opposition needed identity. I agreed and, and I created Hiram and I think it's, it's one of the best little um, additions that I did that wasn't part of Bobby Jones's story. Um, this is the first time that we're seeing Jeremy London in the background with the horses as Webb Langston. I'd originally cast an actor in that role who would have brought something completely different to it. And he had to drop out because he got another gig, a good gig, and I understood. So we went looking for someone else, and it's tough to find a, a character or an actor to play a character like that that's so key to being uh, Cotton Yancey, Sheriff Dan Lee's partner in the film. And he, um, I mentioned Jeremy London to one of our other actors, and uh, Creek Wilson, he was able to get me on the phone with him. And surprisingly, we were able to work it out. And now he's the lead actor in our upcoming movie, The Cornbread Cosa Nostra, which we're filming. Um, we'll be filming while Blood Country is being released. This movie, Blood Country, is, if, if we're counting, uh, is my 10th film as a director, my 10th feature film as a director. And that includes a movie that I was fired from or quit depending on what story you believe in post-production called Recession Road and it also includes a movie that I co-directed with Gus called Black Eros which hopefully will be coming out so this is technically the 10th and it's our third Mississippi film I had worked with Cotton Yancey on two other films before this our first Mississippi movie, Porches and Private Eyes, he played the villain, so to speak. And in a movie that I wrote and produced but did not direct, Don't Come Around Here, he also played. I love working with him, and what I like is that every time we've made a film together, he's um, played a totally different character. Now... He was one of the first people to read Blood Country because he's one of my main Mississippi guys. And originally, I did not see him in the role of um, of Sheriff Dan Lee. It just it just wasn't what I had in mind. Uh, I told him that I was honest with him because he wanted to play it. I thought about casting him as the um, the judge or the doctor. And as, as I watched these video auditions, it just didn't really, um, I didn't find anyone um, that fit it. And I, uh, I ended up casting him. I'll get back to that in a little bit. But this shot where they ride towards us is, to me, a great shot. Again, very minimum coverage. We actually got some shots with the camera on the horse riding next to the other, but it just didn't really work. But this was a scene that we wrote on set. Um, I knew I wanted more moments with Webb and Dan Lee, and this was something that we kind of wrote. I think it adds a lot of texture to their relationship, and I like this further, this idea that Dan Lee doesn't want to carry a gun because he might kill someone. And really, he's he's trying to be a good man in this violent, chaotic world. Now, this was obviously one of the hardest scenes to shoot. Um, Content-wise, filming at night, in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, it's a, it's a very disturbing, controversial scene. Anytime you're working with a KKK-related scene, it would be. Um, we went with an unconventional look, these white dusters that Cotton had, and then we just took this scrap material that I found on one of our locations and cut holes in it. I thought the all white look was real interesting. Now, 
the guy playing the father, Calvin, again, I actually, he did a couple takes and I just didn't feel like he was scared enough in those takes. So I actually stepped in front of the camera and slapped him around a couple times and screamed in his face, um, which was a pretty wild moment for everybody on set. I only do that when I know that I need to do it to get an actor into the right zone and when I'm pretty sure that they're going to trust me um, about that decision. And Calvin, who's fairly inexperienced, did understand what I was doing and he ended up thanking me later because really an actor, at least if they're worth a damn, wants to get into the scene and they will do just about anything to do so. That includes the, the black teenagers. I remember... The one that gets dragged into the scene, that was me dragging him into the scene and placing him in front of Cotton. And um, that was, uh, he just wanted me to do it as hard as I could because he said, don't be easy on me. Um, and I really respect that in actors. They want to feel it. They want it to be real. This is another interesting change from our original script. This was originally seen, was originally set supposedly where Moses Lofton had been shot by Joe Lofton. So it was on like a, a road in the woods. And I told Nick, so at some point the idea sparked, why don't we do a scene that's a little, almost like an ode to how Nick and I work as director and director of photography, planning out shots. You know, we'll talk about maybe we look at it from this angle. No, how about this angle? And we go back and forth. And I said that, that Sheriff Dan Lee and Webb could kind of have that sort of relationship. And no one would really know when watching the movie. But it would be our little inside, you know, wink to our process. And even the way that, you know, Jeremy here is looking at the scene is is almost like he's looking at a scene how to film something in a movie and so this was a really fun change that we made taking it from a a, a road in the woods to this jail scene and i think it just some of the lines that we added it just it brings so much to the film and Really, my favorite part of making movies is these last-minute changes, these last-minute additions, because I think film is a fluid thing. I think that people get too married to their scripts, and they don't let things evolve based on location, based on actors, and all of that. And you have to, because that's where some of the best stuff comes, and the accidents and the spur-of-the-moment ideas so this is definitely one of my favorite moments in the movie. Um, all of these jail scenes, the one you see now and the one you see later, later um, there's a few of them. They remind me of the scenes in Rio Bravo directed by Howard Hawks. Now, they're not exactly like that, but I had that in mind as we staged them. And it makes me smile because it reminds me of that. Um, something just triggered in my mind that, you know, we, at first we're not going to put anyone in sort of anything blue or denim because it doesn't really fit the period. But finally we decided to put Webb Langston played by Jeremy in that consistently. And you'll see him wearing a lot of that. It's sort of a theme for his character that nailing the Warren poster was actually a cameo by Nick, our cinematographer. That was his little cameo in the piece which is a cool moment uh this is one of my favorite scenes to film because i guess i have two cameos in the movie this is a little fight scene that we staged with uh the thing going out the window and them hitting me and it's chris and Bo, our horse wranglers that are roughing me up what's funny about filming this we did a few takes and I trust the two actors in the scene and pretty much didn't pay any attention to them. I was totally focused on the fight, which was a fun moment. Um, definitely a, a fun little night on set, uh, having the crew watch me get beat up and thrown out the saloon. Um, the guy that plays John T., who again is a real-life character, Joe Lofton really did flee to Texas and then hire... 
a lawman to bring him back to Mississippi because he didn't think that he was going to get convicted. But the actor playing John T., the Texas lawman, is Creek Wilson, who I've also worked with two times before this and, and will be working with again soon. Creek just gets it. I mean, he spent like four or five hours on that horse that he's riding right there, Dolly. He he got to know her, and she got to know him. And by the time he was doing this scene, it was just perfect. Um, and he put the kind of time and dedication that a lot of the rest of our cast should have put into being familiar with horses. I'm really impressed by him for that. Um this is a nice little moment between him and Cotton. And they're going to have some good moments, or at least one good moment, kind of similar to this, but in a different context. And our next movie, The Cornbread Cosa Nostra. Um, this scene, a couple things about the location. It was another scene shot at the Florwood State Park in Greenwood. And we ran out of light doing this scene and it was nerve-wracking as hell because we had a bunch of time and then all of a sudden we didn't have time and we were bouncing back and forth between shooting it in the shade or shooting it in the sunlight and this take we got here was like one of the last takes we got where we we said they've got a little bit of sun on them we might just pull it off and again audiences don't realize the the mechanics of making movies but sometimes man it is really tough to get even light and consistent light when you're shooting exteriors. I love how this turned out with the the uh, tree that's in the light and the tree that's in the dark. It just seems like a great visual metaphor for the movie. Now, the road that you see is actually a paved road that we had to pay to have dirt delivered and dumped. And the area you're seeing is pretty much the only area we covered um, there's a lot more pavement and if we had more money and more time we would have covered it with with more dirt but we could only afford to do that and I think our producer and a bunch of people were you know leveling and uh, dirt for a good while until it looked decent so I really like that scene I think it turned out well even though it was hell to shoot this assassination was again back in Canton. There was a rattlesnake, I believe it was a rattlesnake that was right below, right at his left foot when we were setting up for this scene. You could barely see it. It was like wrapped kind of in the wall, but kind of coming out of the wall, and we scared it away. Uh, this guy that plays the assassin, his name is Harry Day, and he uh, he's kind of lives on the property, um, rents, owns, I think he bought a house from Greg, and he was great, he showed us around, he lugged us around with his four-wheeler, and I don't know how we would have done it without him, and gave him a little bit cameo in the movie, and remember he posted on Facebook that he had a cameo in the movie, and what he did was he, he shot a freed slave, so he's got a real sarcastic sense of humor, um, that's a cameo by our, uh, not really a cameo because he's a character in the movie, but that's our assistant director, Mike Ray, who just shot the other one. These scenes were filmed in the in Jacinta, which is also where we filmed uh, the courthouse scenes that you'll see in a bit. The actor, two actors playing the lawyers are Michael Anglin playing Longino, who would eventually be the governor, and Dorsey Carson playing McNair. Dorsey is an actual lawyer in Mississippi, and it was great to work with him for the first time. I think he does a wonderful job in this. The woman who plays the nurse had never been in a film before. Her name is uh, Mammy Davis, and she was nervous as hell, but I worked with her a little bit, and then Cotton really worked with her and just ran the lines over and over and over again, and I really like her little performance. It was cool to feature not just Mississippians, but some true locals who'd never been in movies. Uh, she's She was living in Lawrence County, and the movie's set in Lawrence County. So I think that was a very cool addition. Um, this banjo player, this, this was played on set, not in this take, but it was played on set. 
and uh, he's great. He's a local in the in the uh, Jacinta Corinth area. All of these extras, they're the best extras I've ever seen in my life. They all came dressed for it. We didn't provide any of these costumes. They put the effort into finding their own wardrobe. And they were the quietest, most patient extras I've ever seen for this courtroom. This is the courtroom. And it has a, such a unique look that you won't really get a sense of until you see it in a wide shot. But it's got this round kind of semicircle type thing going on it's just it's just very different um and beautiful and it's one of the only courthouses in mississippi that hasn't really been modernized and that's why we chose it we drove hella far to get there um the concept of this scene was to me again one of those victories for nick and i we were trying you know i hate boring courtroom scenes in movies i like courtroom dramas but i'm petrified of making one and having it just seem so dull and i wanted to do something different nick helped me figure out we figured out together this series of dolly shots that would go from witness to witness lawyer to lawyer transitioning behind people's backs and it was not an easy thing to do. I can't remember how many dolly setups we had in one day, but it was a heck of a lot. And I'm just really proud that we pulled it off. A lot of audience members might not notice what we're doing, but it's great that we we did it for our sake and that we, you know, it really comes across well and has a, a kind of a fluid feeling in the movie. This guy is a... Nicholas Bain is a playing Huddleston, the uh, defense attorney, is or sorry, the the prosecutor is a uh, lawyer and politician in that area. I had not met him before the day of shooting, but he did a great job as well. And uh, the judge back there is a local guy named David Stevens, who's got some Civil War era bands that he leads and and he was really great to work with he helped out a lot too um again this was a super long day the other thing that's interesting about filming at the jacinta courthouse is that a film was made there i still haven't tracked it down still haven't seen it called tomorrow based on a william faulkner source material adapted by Horton Foote and starring Robert Duvall. That was made, I think, back in the 70s. In this, and scenes were shot in this courthouse, which um, I really need to track it down, hopefully before the movie comes out, and uh, give it a look, because it should be fun. It's always fun to see when you, you filmed in the same place, and if you can recognize certain things, or the same angles, how it's changed over time. But we just went shot by shot in this scene chronologically and worked our asses off that day. See, here in the wide, you can really see the glory of, of this courthouse, especially with that light coming in through the window, which we just nailed at the exact right time. It was such a perfect moment. And uh, I'm really happy that we had the honor to shoot here, that it worked out. It's definitely one of the prettiest sequences in the film. One of the ones I'm most proud of. So back to Cotton Yancey and casting him as Sheriff Dan Lee. I didn't see it, but there was no one who auditioned who could even possibly play the role as far as I was concerned. So I started to think a little bit more about it and I told Cotton he had the role and I said it was not contingent on anything but that I would like for him to try and only try he didn't have to lose some weight for the character Cotton ended up taking that very seriously and he lost about 30 pounds to play Sheriff Dan Lee the character if you look at his the original photos of him that are in Bobby Jones's book is more thin, and I felt that just, uh, 
you know, it was just the right nature for this character. And uh, I was really happy that just to see Cotton just take it so seriously uh, that he lost all that weight for the character. And he looks great in it. And uh, I haven't, you know, talked to any audiences who've seen his performance yet. But personally, I think that he just blows people away. Um, this is a little fiasco in the movie, a big boo-boo on the part of the production designer um, and people that printed this. It's all wrong. It's like a goof thing. It says Lawrence County Press, and underneath it, it says Jacinta, Mississippi, which is not in Lawrence County at all. Um, it's just a total goof that they just didn't pay attention, which... It's kind of funny on one hand, and on the other hand, it's regrettable and pisses me off. Um, this is actually on the property where I'm living right now in Brookhaven, um, and it's this little bamboo forest. I thought it would be kind of an interesting setting for these prisoner scenes, which were originally supposed to be more of a chain gang working on the railroad tracks stuff, but we got these guys out here, these volunteer extras, and... Just kind of staged it right there. It's fake rain. Um, a lot of this chasing stuff was shot in Canton with these hunting dogs. Um, it's very difficult working with animals, untrained animals. They were great, but man, it was tough to get them to run where we needed them to run. And if I could do it again and I had, you know, two, three days, I'd love to make more of this scene. But that's just how it goes. Now, Chris, running here... We're in the truck running alongside or driving alongside him, and most of those takes he would outrun the truck. He is fast. He used to play football, and it, we were amazed. And, and talk about tough, too, because he got scratched to hell, and I had him running through the craziest shit in the world, and he didn't complain. He just did it, and he was fully committed to this character, Joe Loft, and I really love what he did with it. And I'm proud of working with him. One of the most easygoing people I've ever worked with in my life. So I, I look forward to creating some more characters with him. This is another happy accident. We saw this field. And it was just the perfect light with the bugs. Such a unique moment with the two of these guys. And saying goodbye. Some of my favorite dialogue that, that I was able to write for the film. Some of the dialogue came straight from the story and assume, you know, I would assume straight from the transcripts that Bobby got his hands on, but a lot of it I would construct based on the scenes that that Bobby described. And uh, this is just a real interesting idea to me that there's just not peace for any for them anywhere in this world, which I think is is very true and haunting the movie is not about race relations but in many ways i think that it touches on it in a realistic way that mississippians can relate to um i hope so at least even the idea the part with you know dan lee and him um having to sort of play kkk to get those answers but regretting it he ends up being haunted by it i think that's something that mississippians can relate to more than some of the hollywood portrayals of the south and um and yeah the south's history so we'll see only time will tell uh what kind of reception this story and the content gets but i think that that's at least uh my perception of it this was a fun scene to film, and actually the first scene that Jeremy shot as the character Webb Langston. This was shot on day two, I think, and a uh, very intricate scene with a, more coverage than usual, a lot going on, people coming in and out of it, um, live mics on the actors, boom and play, um, there's going to be an animal in play during it, introducing another character. So it was definitely uh, not the easiest one to pull off. But it was, uh, I think it's good. And um, I haven't really spoken much about the score for this movie by Mark Ridgway. But 
This is an example of a Q, one of his tracks that I'm really happy with. I like his score a lot. Some of the moments I think he just mastered. I think he just got it so well. Just uh, and this is one of those. Um, we were inspired by the soundtrack for Ain't Them Body Saints. I actually used a lot of that as my temp score when I was editing this movie. And then Mark came in and created an original score. And it was a process to find exactly the sound that we wanted. But once he got it, some of these musical moments in the movie are just uh, so powerful to me. Of course, I'm biased, but I hope that the audience will feel the same watching it, that, that it touches them and moves them the way that, that I've felt doing that. Um, Cotton will improvise a lot in a scene, and he would do so, did so in this scene and, and others, which is something that I welcome in actors. And uh, I think that it can lead to some really great moments. Uh, sometimes it has to be a little controlled. This was a fun little attempt we had at doing a little trick shot. It took us a while to figure out how we wanted to stage this scene. And uh, this idea that he's kind of appears out of nowhere walking behind him was cool, I thought. Um, I mentioned this in a little video I did recently. Um, well, first of all, this was just a great, that opening shot was just a great accident. We were setting up for this. It wasn't an accident. It was Nick, our DP, who saw the light in those trees and said, we need to shoot the wide shot first. We were going to go in and shoot all of this first. But he saw that light, and we went for it and set up for it for as quickly as possible. Um, scenes like this are really tough. Working with fire, live fire, is tough. Um, not in a dangerous way for something like this, but you're having to constantly feed it. So really, in each of these shots, we've got two or three people, our makeup artist and a couple other ones, right beside the fire, feeding it brush as we go. This is another example of a scene that is completely dubbed. Uh, all of these lines are iPhone, cell phone recorded lines laid in by our sound, um, re-recording sound mixer, Jeffrey Reed. Um, and I can tell, some people can probably tell, but I doubt that many audience members will be able to tell that this is not a natural thing. Um, what might a man do is sort of the tagline for the film. That's what these characters are saying. And um, it's, it's, I kind of hope that it, it has a little bit of a, uh, that, that it lingers in people's minds, this idea of what might a man do, which has such a violent sound to it and seems very um, relevant to our times. Um, so does a lot of this, in my opinion. I've spoken about it with several people and they don't really see what I'm talking about, so it might just be me, but when I wrote Blood Country, I felt that it was very much a movie of our times because it it's about white people who are angry and they're angry at the change in their country. They don't know what to do about it and it ends up causing all this chaotic violence. Violence that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't have a purpose. Um, it's just kind of, you know, they kill people at random. And, you know, some audience members might say, well, they don't understand why he kills his brother. Or they don't understand, you know, why they shoot James Sauls under the porch, which you'll see in just a little bit. Um, Real quick segue, this is an ode to my darling Clementine. Him doing the foot thing on the post is uh, a little nod to the moment with Henry Fonda. Um, this is a fun scene to shoot back in Sontag. But like I was saying, to me, in an abstract way, it connects to our time, um, to the day we're living in uh, there's a lot of people i think that are angry in america and a lot of violence right underneath the surface waiting to break loose uh and and that's kind of what this movie is about and about a, someone who's trying to seek justice and figure out how to be a good man 
in a world that just doesn't really make any sense. And that's what this world doesn't make any sense. Um, there's no real justice. And uh, sometimes the good guy wins. Sometimes the people you thought were good turn against you. It just doesn't make um, a whole lot of logical sense. So this is another scene we shot in Canton. There's a little beach right next to on that property right next to the Big Black River. It was really hard to get to. That guy Harry Day helped us get all of our gear out there. Um, I think it was worth it, but it was definitely a challenge to get out there. This is absolutely one of my favorite scenes of the film because it came out the way that I saw it in my head with no dialogue and this um, just very quiet, sexually tense moment that's almost like two kids touching for the first time, but there's all this, you know, suppressed sexuality in it right before there's extreme violence. Um, this is a true thing that he was shot from underneath the porch <clears throat> while he was on it with her. And who knows if it happened exactly like this, I doubt it. But it definitely is a very was a shocking thing to read in Bobby's um in Bobby's book. And uh I I'm proud of the way that we sort of pulled it off. Um the we used blank gauge and actually shot for real underneath that porch. Also, I like the, the idea that we delay seeing the violence in this movie quite a bit. You don't ever see someone get shot and you see, you know, a squib or something like that. You see reactions or you see the aftermath, which is my preference in general when it comes to violence. I think it has a bigger effect and I see that more in European cinema. This was a tough shot to get, but I think a really good one. Again, an idea that that Nick and I developed of this long shot that would would change focus, um, telling a story of the body being let off, the doctor, and really Cotton's getting to a point here, Dan Lee's getting to a point where he is wondering, you know, wh why does God allow things like this to happen? He's a, he's a believer in God. And he's wondering, you know, how can this be happening to my community? And it didn't make any sense. And, and I think it's, he really starts to become haunted here. Um, during this part of the script, minus this narration, I was trying to eliminate as much dialogue as I could. And I think there's a good eight pages of the script where there's barely a line. I wish I could have done half the movie that way, and maybe one day I will. Um, but, you know, I, I think that dialogue and sound is incredibly important to movies. It's as important as picture, but that doesn't mean that every scene should just be filled with, with dialogue or, uh, you know, filled with speaking lines that you can communicate a lot just through images. I love silent films. I love the westerns of John Ford where he doesn't just pack the screen with a bunch of lines. He would strip it out of the script and try to figure out if there was anything that could be done without a line, communicate it without a line, he would do it. So um, that I, th I think is a very interesting concept. This scene, I realized recently that I've had a dream scene in the last four movies and I'm going to have one in Cornbread Costa Nostra, our next film, and this is, this is, you know, the end of the montage, which we don't know is a dream at first, but we end up figuring that out in a little while. And I was recently just sort of wondering what my fascination is or, that I keep having dream scenes where people die or come close to death in uh, my films. And maybe that's not that, obviously that's not that unique, but there must be something there that I keep wanting to revisit. I really love the way that this turned out and the way that it was cut and the, the way that um, Mark's music um, connects with it and, and, and leads to that really sharp moment where he slits his throat.
Now, I haven't spoken really much yet about Marlene Cupid, who plays Matt, uh, Dan Lee's real-life wife in the movie. And she kind of starts to play a bigger role in the last third of this film. I worked with her first on Ports and Private Eyes, and she's just so great to work with. She's not really an actress. She's a teacher who started this great business for a program for nurses to pass their main exam, their NCLEX exam. And, and she's not a, a, a traditional performer, meaning that she doesn't have a lot of on-screen experiences, but she's just such a natural. And with this role, I really wanted to challenge her to do something totally different than she'd done in Porches and Private Eyes. I think she nails it. Um, this this you know very tough sheriff's wife, a steadfast woman, a woman of the times, uh, who supports her husband, and uh, she's got to be strong through this time. Um, this is the kind of relationship that I see as an ideal marriage, an ideal relationship between a man and a woman. So it was fun to create that on screen. Um, this was shot in Greenwood. Uh, we were able, thanks to Terry and uh, Jennifer Key, we were able to use real blanks. Terry's back there at the first gunshot, um, which really added a lot to the film, being able to use real blanks in it. The guy that you're going to see dead, who's part of the Joe gang here, is Kelly Porter. He's a constable and uh, also works in the sheriff's department and the fire department in Lincoln County. A good friend. We worked with them on Don't Come Around Here. And then uh, I just love hanging out with him. And um, he's in this, and he's going to be in the next one too. So it's just so much fun to um, incorporate local people. Now, this there really is a cannonball in the wall at the church. Um, and there's an interesting story that goes behind it with you know Union soldiers coming in and the Confederacy firing on their own church. And it's, it's a long story. I wanted to incorporate it somehow, and originally I was going to sort of go into the whole story, but just this slight mention of it, this idea that the new preacher wants to take the cannonball out of the wall, but Dan Lee doesn't think that they should because you don't want to forget about the past, even if it's painful, even if it hurts, it's there, and... They shouldn't remove it because it's there to always remind them of the good and bad, the life and death that came during that time. Uh, this was a great shot, this leading up shot, and Kevin Graff, who plays Hiram, just nailed it. I remember how surprised we were on the first couple takes when he came out and did this little nagging of Dan Lee as they're walking up. It was just such a great character moment, like something out of a John Ford or Howard Hawks picture. I did, it's not at all what I saw in my head, um, but that didn't matter because Kevin brought something truly original and surprised me as a director. Uh, I love when actors can do that kind of thing. Um, this scene, I'm curious to see if audiences will laugh in this scene because it just cracks me up with Webb yelling inside, Joe yells back. It seems clear that Dan can hear Joe because he's yelling pretty loud, but regardless, Webb you know, repeats what he has to say. And um, I may have a weird sense of humor, but this is the kind of scene that I find to be hilarious. Um, I should mention that, you know, the vigilantes who were out to get Joe. Originally, I imagined there being more like 15, 20 of them, but we only had so many people, so many uh, people that came in to do it. And you just gotta, when you're working with a low budget, you can't just hire anyone you want. You gotta adapt to that. And I think it's okay. I think it, it turns out fine that we, um, we end up having this small group that wants to get Joe versus a small group that's that's defending him or at least protecting him. I really love the way Nick shot these scenes inside this house in Greenwood. Um, he's just got such a great visual style. Uh, you know, we don't always agree on shots, but 
he really um, he really brings an incredible cinematic feel to the stories that I've written, and the combination of of my vision and his vision leads to great things, in my opinion. Uh, certainly, it continues to develop and get better with every film we make. This is one of the most important scenes of the movie, and I knew it going into it. Uh, this moment between Joe and Dan where they level with each other. I remember Nick saying on set that it's some of the best shot stuff that he shot during this film. Just these simple but well-framed shots of Dan and Joe. Remember Cotton did about four or five takes, and I can't remember what I told him before the fourth or fifth. It, somehow it went from good to great, and he was already bringing you know just just a great feeling to it. But sometimes it's those subtle little touches, and look at him he's he's able to communicate so much without doing a whole lot with his voice or with his face and that's what a lot of people don't understand is he he really gets how to be a film actor he really gets how to communicate on screen um and it's just kind of a natural thing but it's also something he takes very seriously and works hard at and both of these actors i think that they equal each other um, and and if there had been an imbalance, then the movie wouldn't work. But in my opinion, again, a very biased opinion, there is there is a balance between the anti-hero and the protagonist. And they Joe and, and Cotton, I mean Chris and Cotton are are playing on the same level the way that you know Pacino and De Niro played on the same level. And Heat or Richard Boone and Randolph Scott played on the same level in The Tall T. And that's super important when you're casting. It's very, very important. Um, I love this line in my life um, where Joe realizes that Dan is willing to die for him, not because he likes Joe, he despises Joe, but for justice, for doing the right thing. And there's not a Again, talking about it being relevant to our times, I think that's sort of a foreign concept. A lot of our society is based on doing what's right for you, for yourself. But Dan wants to do what's right for because it's just. He wants to uphold um, justice. He wants to um, walk into his house justified, as they would say in, this, in a Sam Peckinpah film. And it's a very Western concept. Um, I kind of am a believer that true Westerns are not just cowboy movies. True Westerns in some way are an exploration of justice and um, code, the moral code inside each of us. And oftentimes it's a conflict of moral code that is really what defines a great Western. Um, again, back to these jail scenes and Greenwood. And uh, I love this moment with Hiram coming to the door. Again, a scene where I, you know we didn't feel like it was necessary to come around and get a shot on Cotton because this is Hiram's moment. This is, this is him um, establishing that Everyone that was against, or not everyone, but a lot of people that were against, or that were for, sorry, Dan Lee becoming sheriff are now against him. Just because he's protecting um, Joe to make sure that, that, you know, he gets a trial, that he goes to prison, that he isn't lynched. And there's uh, a lot of difference between Dan Lee and this Hiram guy who doesn't really believe in what's right. He doesn't really believe in um, the justice that Dan Lee does. I love this moment between Cotton and the doctor. As I, I, I remember writing this and just thinking about these subtle moments in movies that I'll love where a character 
who could go either way. He could be a coward or he could be a hero. Sort of explains in a subtle, indirect way that he's going to hang in there. He's going to stick it out with the hero and sacrifice his life. And I'm really attracted to that in films and want to create those kind of moments in my films. These next few scenes were some of the most complicated that we shot because there's just so much happening in them. And whereas some days on Blood Country we would shoot five, six scenes, we focused a lot of time on this and we would block it ahead of time. Sometimes we'll just go into it and you know, shoot it very quickly, but this had to be blocked out and rehearsed. And really worked with to figure out where all the players were going to stand, how they were going to interact with each other. There's just a lot going on. And I hope that it doesn't get missed. I hope this little alcohol moment with the doctor doesn't get missed. And these tiny nuances in the scene. Um, it's hard as a director to keep things moving, but also make sure that you leave enough time for those moments. And oftentimes I think that one of my failures as a filmmaker is that I don't leave enough time or through editing and shooting, I don't capture that well enough. And something I'm still trying to get better at, I think that parts of Blood Country improve on it, but it's something that I still want to do more and more. This coming up was just such a fun moment to film with Marlene showing up on the wagon and uh, we had her jump off the wagon but unfortunately the shot just didn't work and then this moment with the whip she had a lot of fun practicing with the whip in the weeks leading up to making the movie our vigilantes sort of closing in we pushed her and pushed her to just get more and more vicious and I think she finally just got that look in her eye which is the kind of look you never want to see from a woman, that's for sure. Um, she just looks like she wants to tear right through you. And then, you know, you have all this drama, and you follow it up with comedy, which is another thing that I like in movies, when things are back-to-back -back like that. And it goes back to the old days, this kind of humor of her taking a drink. And Jeremy's face there is just hilarious, his reaction to it. Um, but mixing those things up... You see that in Rio Bravo, you see it in Red River, where you'll go from something super serious to something comedic in a matter of seconds. And um, again, I like that. Um, I'm proud of the way we staged this scene, a sort of a showdown right before the final chase. That's Bo and uh, Chris on the horses. And then Josh Priest is an actor who came from Texas to be part of this. He's one of the good guys in the scene writing with the doctor and Webb. And uh, this was complicated, but um, you just do it in a very meth uh, methodical way. And um, you think about timing and pacing and get the coverage you need. And um, I think it turned out fairly well. Um, doing action is also, I think one of my weaknesses as a director, but I'm not going to stay away from it. I'm going to keep trying to get action scenes down and get better and better at them. Obviously, budgets are a concern, but this wagon chase um, is the best that we could do with the time that we've got. And um, I love the, the, the... Chris and Bo said they could ride across the water or through the water like this, and I, I hadn't considered it until they said that, and it's just such a great little moment to see that, um, to see them cross through the water, add some production value. And, and it was great to have some really good horsemen on our set to make this better. We also shot, as you could tell, from inside the wagon, which was bumpy as can be. I mean, it was the bumpiest ride of my life. Um, but all of that combined together, um, adds to a certain level of intensity which I think gets this final action sequence so to speak across on a really low budget um, we almost ran out of time this day I mean we got this scene this shot right here without much light left at all it looks beautiful but it was 
it was so tough to um, to really get it. And what happened here, where they fooled the the riders, the vigilantes, is part of the true story. Also, the burning down of uh, Sheriff Dan Lee and Matt's house is part of the true story. The town was so angry with Dan for taking Joe away and not letting them lynch him that they burned his house down. And again, this is sort of the final disillusionment for Dan, who really believed in the good of people. Um, but he, he doesn't anymore, or it's been challenged. Um, this idea that he baptizes himself is the concept here at, at the pond where he goes to think. Um, it's not necessarily a completely positive thing, this religious image of him dunking himself under the water. Um, he is very disturbed by humanity, by our nature as humans, and... He wants to wash himself clean of it. Um, I don't know if his expression after he comes up really shows that he has. He's a haunted man now. One quick note that I forgot to mention is that we consciously had Dan wear really light clothes in the beginning. And then as you'll notice now, he's wearing black. Um, as if his soul has become darkened by this experience. And that was something that Cotton and I talked about. It's a very subtle thing that I wanted to do where he would slowly, um, his, his, his wardrobe would become darker and darker as the movie went along. Eventually we see him in gray and he's kind of in the middle ground, but that was the concept behind that choice. Um, this little thing with the monkey in the paper is an odd moment. Um, to me, it's supposed to hint in a funny way to the idea that we're all animals. Um, you know, Dan and Matt believe that we're created differently by God than animals, but I think that, that what I wanted to do here was hint that we're all animals, we're all vicious, we're all violent, and um, that's what's going on in this film. And, and Dan is trying to come to terms with it. Who knows if anyone is ever going to pick up on that? Probably not. Uh, I bet money that, that most people won't. But it's there in the movie as part of the thematic story, the thematic element of the film. Now, in this last near, not last sequence, but this, this moment where the judge shows up again and explains what's happened since Joe went to prison... Um, was a way to combine a lot of what really did happen as described in Bobby's story. The reason I included this is that even after Joe left, he there was all this violence that ended up occurring related to his wife, Lavinia, and the cycle of violence, randomness, random violence, really continued associated with her a lot of people read the script and said is she really the one that murdered um his brother is she really sort of the villain the secret twist ending villain and i was like no you're you're missing the point it it's not that simple this is not a, a black and white story where there's good guys and bad guys it's just that this woman who maybe kind of goes from man to man trying to survive doing what she can perhaps using her sexuality to get what she wants just tends to end up in these violent situations it doesn't have an answer it can't be logically explained but it's fascinating and i think we see that kind of stuff around us all the time usually when we watch a movie everything's spelled out but that's not what life's like. And to me, that's what this last sequence is. is you know, the judge is telling Dan all of this in kind of a very humorous way. Um, but Dan, again, it's more evidence to him that this doesn't seem to be a world that is has any logical sense. There doesn't seem to be any order to it. Things are just kind of happening randomly and motivations are unclear um the justice 
of not only human justice, but the justice of God is not necessarily clearly at work. Um, he becomes confused. And that's what his final speech leads to. This hanging shot that came up was an interesting one to pull off. We actually had the actor stand on a table and then we painted it out in post-production. I think it works fairly well, again, for a low budget. Um, and this ambiguity that, you know, Lavinia has a child, it might be Joe's, it might be James Saul's, the guy who got shot under the porch, it might be someone else's entirely, is fascinating. Um, now, Bobby's story, and anyone who's interested in this movie should read it, even goes further. It goes further than, than Joe getting released, which is what happens in this scene. Um, it goes into him, I think, moving after he gets released. He moves to, uh, to Texas and then Oklahoma, or maybe it's just Oklahoma. And he reconnects with some of his offspring and then there's even a sort of a rumored story of him going to South America. And, and that was something I decided not to include in the film because it just didn't fit thematically. There was a time <clears throat> when outlining it that I thought, maybe I'll have an older Joe telling the story or an older Joe that we see at the very end uh, who has some kind of reflection on it. But... I just decided that it didn't fit. And from a very early point, I wanted to have an ending with an almost symbolic and abstract, um, that was symbolic and abstract. And that's what this concept that you'll see in a couple scenes from now with the black man by the river. Now, originally in our, my first iteration, the black man, um, just takes him across the river. He doesn't say his name, I don't think. I think that's the original script didn't have his name. And uh, he sings a song um, as they're going across the river. And it was the idea that Joe's uh, going to the other side figuratively. He's going to heaven or hell. Um, the next uh, version of it was that Joe steals the black man's boat because he's blind and doesn't know that it's it's got a link in it and actually sinks the boat in the middle of the river and has to swim across. If we could have pulled that off, I think it would have been epic because it really would have shown his how much of a scrapper and survivor he is. However, it, I think that concept lost some of the symbolism that what we ended up doing contains which really, um, again, is back to this idea that Joe could be going to hell. It's not quite clear. And again, I'll be curious to see how audiences react to it. Some people hate my ambiguous endings, but I think that it's the right way to end this film. Dan, a good man who gives this speech, is haunted. He realizes that all men, good and evil, the most despicable and the most good, come from the same place. Um, we're all created by God, he, he, he says, or we're all animals, I say. And really, um, this is disturbing. When he says, let us pray, he's sort of saying, you know, well, let's, let's hope for the best. Let's ask for, for mercy. Um, and this is the scene that I was talking about. This actor playing the old black man played by a guy named Larry Love Tate. He never acted before. We put all this crazy makeup on him, put some blind contacts in his eyes, and I think he's just got a great look and presence here. Um, we were warned not to film. This is the Pearl River in Mississippi. We were warned not to film there, and we, all, we, we actually did end up sinking that little boat that was built for, for this film, and Thankfully, our actors did not drown. They were able to get to shore safely, but it was a wild, wild moment. And it was the last thing we shot for Blood Country. Now, before I go, I uh, wanted to mention this song, which was recorded by um, our composer, Mark Ridgway, with a girl named Kirsty Hatfield singing and Cotton Yancey singing on backup. The... Um, 
and Daryl uh, Williams, I believe is his last name, doing harmonica. The um, significance of this for me is it's the hymn, Shall We Gather at the River or At the River? And it's used in a lot of Western movies, notably the John Ford films, but also uh, just a lot of Westerns in general, The Wild Bunch, Jeremiah Johnson. We had to use it in this film, I felt. It was essential. I have it in the church scene in the beginning. We weren't quite sure what song we were going to feature at the end of Blood Country, but I introduced the idea that we have this song but that it have a real dark tone to it. It took us a little while to get there and to find the right sound for it. I really like the way that it closes things off in the film. I hope that you've enjoyed listening to this, and I'm sorry if I rambled on or didn't complete any thoughts, um, but I hope that this shed some light on our film, how we made it, why we made it and i hope that you'll keep watching our work keep supporting our work and you know please let me know if you did listen to this please let me know whether you liked it or not and how we can record a better commentary in the future i appreciate it and thanks for watching blood country by the throne of God.